Hi, welcome back. Okay, I think sound's working now. Thanks, uh, Megan, for troubleshooting that one. Um, so Apologies, we, volunteers. Thanks for your patience. We just talked about real fossils. This is the jawbone of a new species of river dolphin from Panama. Uh, I dug this out of the rock in 2011 with members of my lab and Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute staff. Um, and we'll be publishing on this later this year, giving it a name. There's a skull and a beautiful shoulder bone that goes with it. Um, that's the real thing. Here's a 3D print from a 3D model that you can actually download and access at 3d.si.edu. Um, one of the things I mentioned was how important that was for creating a replica of the real thing that enhances the accessibility and visibility of what we hold and trust in natural history collections. Um, you, if you live in Panama City, you could go see a painted copy of this on display at the Bio Museum. Or better yet, if you have a 3D printer, download your own. If you don't, you can go through a web browser and actually interact with the tour that I made of this object, take measurements, see how we built it, download the CT data that we did, that we collected to uh, make this 3D print. This is really revolutionary, revolutionizing how we do natural history because there's tremendous amount of feedback between not just the usual functions that we have in natural history museums, but also outside natural history museums. Other people who might want to use these tools and objects for different projects that may be completely unrelated to science. And I think that's really important for enhancing the value of the real thing with a replica, either manifested physically or in, in the digital realm. So uh, part about how we're going to move downstairs. I found this today um, in our collections around here. We have departmental libraries. We found out earlier today that True is actually the world's most interesting curator, uh, creating these divisional libraries. And one thing I found in them as trying to prepare for this tour was this document. So this is kind of fun. Um, volunteers, that is True's handwriting. And um, the other name on this Remington Kellogg. These two guys never met. True died in 1914. Kellogg was still maybe in high school, early years of college at Kansas. Um, it's addressed to Remington Kellogg at Biological Survey, which is where he went in the 19, early 1920s after finishing his PhD at UC Berkeley. Actually, on the same place I did my PhD, Shark Tooth Hill Bone Bed. You can search more for that online. Um, really funny kind of coincidence that's not planned, not intentional whatsoever. Um, we both worked on the in Bakersfield, California for a dissertation. So it's addressed to Kellogg, and it's not Kellogg's handwriting. It's probably a secretary addressed it to Kellogg. But it was received by him at Biological Survey before he later went on to Carnegie Institution and then the Smithsonian here, where he became, rose to prominence administratively, and also an influence, especially with the International Whaling Commission. So true to Kellogg, what was going on here? Unpublished manuscript. So, True is very interested in knowing about how our records or our knowledge about biological organisms in one part of the world related to them in other parts of the world. That was the impetus behind his 1904 publication on whalebone whales of the North Atlantic. Are they the same species here as they are on the east coast of the North Atlantic in Europe? He was doing the same thing here with fossil whales and never got to publish it. And so in my hands is this wonderful documentation, all written in his original handwriting, going through all the lists of species and genera that are shared between Europe and North America. I haven't actually had time to really read through all this document. I literally found it this morning, but I thought it'd be a really interesting object to share uh, as we talk about Frederick William True. The other thing, uh, um, so we'll be talking, we'll bring this down to libraries. Two other things before we go down there. Something I was showing during the live tweeting, uh, and at the beginning of this, was this bone here. This is the arm bone of Leptophoca lenix. This is a fossil seal from the Calvert uh, Formation. This is actually discovered one year before that logbook that was transcribed by Vaughn Pierce, collected by Frederick William True. I mentioned it was William Palmer. I'm, in, I'm incorrect in that way. It was actually True himself who collected this which is the name bearer. This is the specimen which we use to, when we talk about this fossil species, this is it. USNM, let me get the number right, 574, three digit USNM number. Uh, I think that was later revised to 
five three five nine. So we have different numbers through different periods of time. The important thing, and I'll show this to you on the box as I put the specimen down. The red star. You'll see that occasionally throughout the museum collections, and that's a really important thing. That's the type specimen. So all of our collections are important, but some things we want to keep track of and care for much more so than the average specimen. That's the type specimen. That's this. If you go on my Twitter feed, you can see snapshots of a 3D model that we'll be releasing of this in the near future so that you can um, download and measure your own, just like you would with the Panama Dolphin, yet to be named. So um, we still do the same things that we used to do in natural history even 100 years ago. That almost wraps up what we have up here, but I would like to share one thing. And this is actually a really cool logbook that I found from the same um, pile of documentation in the Kellogg Library, the descendant divisional library that True actually created over 100 years ago. Where I found this document, I also found this, this marble-covered little tattered notebook. Um, I didn't know what it was until I opened it up. And I'm going to be really careful doing this, but you can see actually a picture of this on the BHL blog. This is a museum notebook that Frederick William True recorded during his Europe trip of 1883-1884 as he went from here to London to Paris to Belgium to collect data on living species of dolphins for his great comparison because he also wanted to know are the species of dolphins that we see today and that have been described from the west coast of the Atlantic here in North America the same as the ones on the east coast of the Atlantic in Europe. And so the way that you would know that is by actually investigating who described what in different museum collections. And the amazing thing is here are the data. This is the data by which True created his revision of Delphina Day, which I think is 1909, 1907, 1911. It's on the BHL blog. I should know this better, but a little spotty on oceanic dolphins. But what's great is that you can see, if I can get this in the light, um, not quite there. There's a little red wax pencil annotation to this, and I can show that to you really nicely here. Um, I'll have Megan tweet this out. So that is so um, we just took a picture of True's note to himself. Well, it's a note. If found, please return to Frederick William True, uh, Esquire, at American Exchange, four four nine Strand, London. So that's the hacienda he was staying at in London uh, while he was doing his work at the Natural History Museum, London, uh, the building that Sir Richard Owen created. Um, and the red wax pencil annotation is likely to be Remington Kellogg. So while these guys never met, they did have court, they did have documentation that cut across their lifetimes. And that's fundamentally another aspect of the human connections that transpire all throughout this museum. It is about the objects, the objects that we hold in trust for decades, if not centuries, because they tell us about how the world is out there, how it was, how it's changing, how it might be. But there's also the human connection is uh, humans are sci or scientists are humans just like everybody else out there. And we have interests that do expand, extend outside the museum. But we also want to know about what somebody did, somebody who we probably in some cases maybe never met. So that kind of knowledge and sharing knowledge is recorded in museum notebooks. Um, it's not all digital. It's actually physical in this sense. And that's the value of having the physical side, field books, notebooks, documentation that's archived here all throughout the Smithsonian. Um, how about we switch and go downstairs and visit yeah. the lovely Wrap people? Wrap up. Thanks, volunteers, books. for your patience. And thank you, Nick, for no all of this fascinating insight, um, and especially the opportunity to see some of these items up close. Yeah. It's really cool. All right, we'll see you in a few minutes in the library.